I'm going to read the words out loud in Acts 13 and then pray. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John, or John Mark, to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, or the governor, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the God. But Elimus, the magician, for this is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul uh, believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. These are God's words. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, open our hearts so you might fill it. We desperately long for your presence here today. We thank you in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're in a new sermon series. We have been going through, um, we have been going through Acts, um, and we took a little hiatus for um, the holidays and the new year, but now we are back. So if you're like, man, I'm like in the middle of the Acts and I don't know what, you can listen to all those things later. But right now, I'm really, really excited because our new sermon series is On the Road with St. Paul, an invitation to a life on the move. So On the Road with St. Paul. And today's sermon is going to be called Sent, Sent, just Sent, one, one Sent. I kept on saying Sent, but only one Sent. We'll be taking nine weeks covering three missionary journeys and one little small pit stop back in Jerusalem um, of Paul, or as we have known so far as Saul, whose name turns to Paul. Um, Spoiler. Uh, Paul is going to invite us to view what it looks like to be a person that is sent. With St. Paul as our guide, he invites us to see how the God who saves is also the God who sends. St. Paul believes it is God who sends, that he is the grand storyteller calling us to a life of more. So with the wind to our back and the sun on our face, it is with purpose that God is sending us, Everwell Church, bringing a message for all people about a better land who is a better king and where all people are welcome to be It's people. So to a life on the move, being sent is really simple. It's a life that is going somewhere with purpose. Going somewhere with purpose. Um, Alan Page Lightman is an American physicist. You might have heard of him. He's a writer, a social entrepreneur. He has served on the faculties of Harvard and Massachusetts, the Institute of Technology, and is currently the professor of practice of the humanities at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, He has this really profound, small little quote that says this. Alan Lightman says, the world is moving faster and faster, but the real question is this, where are we going? 
we are moving faster and faster. Technology, it's like an instant, right? Like, my daughter's like, why isn't it streaming? And you're like, you don't even know what dial-up is. You can't complain. <laughs> and it's not landing here. Um, uh, not cable internet. <laughs> Those AOL CDs that I used to, like, chuck around. Those are fun. Um, but the world is moving faster and faster. But no one's taking a moment to just... Stop and say, where are we going? Um, I think that it's super important. So we're just going to look at three things in this text. It's kind of set up um, perfectly like God did it or something. It's set apart. Second, sent out. And third, seek and save. Set apart, um, sent out, and seek and save. So we're going to look at set apart verses one through two. Um, And it goes like this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, um, Simeon, who was called Niger. um, He was from Africa. Lucius of Cyrene. Manon, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. And Saul, which we now know as the Apostle Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas, Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Um, When I think about um, that word set apart, um, I don't know what to think of it. My mom used to say it to me all the time. She's like, you are set apart um, uh, for the Lord. And all I knew is that meant I can't watch PG-13 movies. Like, (laughs) like, like, can um, Can I watch Ace Ventura Pet Detective? No, you're set apart. I'm like, what? What does that mean? Set apart from what? Like I'm in time out? Like what does it mean that I am set apart? The Bible has this silly um, theological language called um, sanctification or being set apart. Um, I think the idea of being set apart is what makes Christians so square um, in in the world. Um, I think there is this sense of God has set us apart for certain things and we constantly try to put our hat on backwards and say, aren't we cool? Listen to our music. It sounds like Radiohead. Like, like listen to music, it sounds like Coldplay. You know, like, it's, it's, it's cool, right? This Christian music stuff, this is what we should do. And for some reason, we constantly try to uh, make our place and space in the world. And um, we just don't really fit. Um, and we wonder what that is. And I, I, I grew up my whole life, I, I mean, I was a super Christian nerd growing up. You have to know this. Like, I would, like, raise my hands at, like, fifth grade and stuff. Kids were making fun of me. It broke my heart when I saw these kids making fun of me as I was worshiping. And I'll tell you why it broke my heart. It did not break my heart because they were making fun of me. It broke my heart because I felt like they thought I was trying to be better than them. And I it just, I never got it. And my mom would like look at me and she has journals of journals and journals being like, Josh wanted to be a part of this friend group. And it just didn't work out. Lord, help him know that he's set apart for you. Help him stop being weird too. No, he, she didn't say that. <laughs> but I never got it. I never understood. I, I never understood why God, why didn't you choose me to be set apart? Because being set apart doesn't seem special. Seems, it seems difficult. It seems weird. It seems unnormal. My daughter, I love her. Every sermon illustration brought to you by Lola Clementine. Um, Lola, she's four years old, and she, she says this phrase I can't get enough of. She goes, Dad, you love me more than everyone. Dad, you love me. Why do you love me so much? Um, and I adopted this. I grabbed it from some smarter, more compassionate dad. So I'm just sticking, I'm stealing it. But I said, Lola, I love everyone, but you're my special girl. Lola, I love everyone, everyone, but you're my special girl. And with that, there is this set apartness. Right? Yeah, like we are called to be people that love everyone, right? God, he he died for everyone. He loves everyone. Not just people in this church, but everyone. But you here today, no matter if you don't believe him or you believe him with your whole heart, you're his special boy and girl. 
today. I really, really feel like that's a word for one of you today that you just have not been feeling special. And God says, I died for you. I might love everyone, but you're my special person. So what do we see here? Well, we see these leaders. And this is right after um, Herod the Great, or not Herod the Great, Herod Herod Antipatus. He um, did this really crazy, weird kind of, um, trying to think of the guy's name. Who's Rocket Man? Elton John. He did this like Elton John thing to where he was wearing like this super shiny outfit in the front of everybody starving all of the people. Came outside. You guys might have remembered this um, story, maybe not. And he comes outside and says, worship me. You know, he's like, everybody's worshiping. You know, the, the image of a God, not a man. Like that was like the thing. And he was like, rocket man. And he, maybe not doing that, but he was doing that. You guys are dead out there. Laugh, it's fine. Um, But he was out there, and he was going after, and God struck him down. And it was not only because God struck him down, but he was persecuting the church. And God took care of that person. And then we go into this place to where they enter into a time to where there is no persecution. Okay, so there's no persecution in the church. Remember, the church is being added to daily based upon the persecution, based upon this new thing of what God has done and this powerful thing. But look at these leaders. What do we see them doing? It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So this idea of set apart, well, what what is being set apart in this text? Well, the first thing is, is that there's a time and space that is set apart. Set apart of a space and time while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. See, all Jewish people um, believe that the Lord cared about worshiping and creating a space and a time. That's why there are so many festivals in the Bible. That is why there are so many things that they're saying, okay, on you know, the Sabbath day, we're going to keep it holy, that God would create space, and then he would fill it. He would create space, and he would fill it. This is how it started in the very beginning in creation. God would create land, and then he would fill it. He'd create water, and then he would fill it. He'd create the heavens, and then he would fill it. We get in this idea, this is like a pattern that God does. So they are creating time. They're creating worship. See, what do we not see them doing? I don't know why I'm hitting you, sorry. We do not see them writing up a powerful strategy. How are we going to rule the world? What is our evil plan to save the world? Like, what, what are we going to do here? You know, are we going to get the Hillsong people to come sing? Or, you know, are we going to get Tim Keller to come preach? Like, what are we going to do to really create and write up a powerful strategy to get the whole world on fire for Jesus? And we can think that too, right? We can think about the strategies. We don't see these men, these leaders of the church, writing up a powerful strategy, but waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? These are our forefathers of the faith. You don't see them stressing and being like, man, we need to have it like cooler. Or, or maybe if we give a better branding, then that could really work. Or No, we see these guys humbly after being persecuted, have a space and time and saying, God, we're going to create this space. I get so scared when I have every single thing planned in such a way, because when I have every moment planned, there is no space for the Holy Spirit to fill it. Maybe that needs to happen in your life, that you have, whether it's in your work life, whether it's in your relationships, whatever it is, you pretty much have it handled. It's all under control. There is no space for the Holy Spirit to do something amazing. I long for you to be like these church leaders saying, where in my life can I create space? Oh, I can work a little bit longer. You know, it's 1 a.m., I can work till 1.30, right? Instead of saying, I'm going to take that 30 minutes, create space, and I'm going to go sleep and say, God, you take care of the rest. That's insane. We're not going to do that. Josh, don't tell me what to do with my time. They're worshiping the Lord. What does that entail? Well, John 4, oh my gosh, can we read this? John 4 says this in verse 19. Of course we can read it. I'm talking. 
The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. That's what Everwell's named after. It's named after this woman at the well, if you never got that before. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Okay, they're talking about space. Should we, should we go out into the great outdoors and, you know, just, you know, worship God out there by the creek? That's what Benjamin Franklin and all of our, you know, deist uh, presidents are like, we don't need church. We'll just go out into the mountainside. Um, should we do that? Or in Jerusalem, in the big church, will you worship the Father? And should, should we go there? That's what you say. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. Look for this, look for this. The hour, time, you got that? The hour is coming when neither on this mountain, space, right? Neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming, excuse me, When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Okay, isn't that cool? So what he says here is like, hey, time and space don't matter as much as if there is a true worshiper for God to fill. Does that, does that kind of make sense that he is setting apart some sort of instrument so that the God of the universe might fill? It's not going to be in a certain place and it's not going to be at a certain time, but we are going to be able to pray without ceasing that we are going to be these people that though we are walking and though we are talking, that God, is, as we allow ourselves to create space of worshiping God, it says this. I mean, this verse is easy. God inhabits what? The praises of his people. Oh, that's interesting. Right? Like that's, that's, that's God can work with that. Secondly, what we see them doing is fasting. And this is my little thing. If you want to fast for it with us, At 6.30 to next 6.30, please do. Fasting is a symbol and a practice to set our hearts on this fact. Listen. You're like, I don't want to listen about fasting. Listen. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So fasting is then relying for strength and power that food cannot give. When we fast, we're not calling for manipulation of God to get what we want, but a sacrifice of our base wants for what he wants to do. When I fast, I say, I am let going of my wants because I want what you want. I realize that I am in complete reliance for you. It's not based on my strategy and it's not based on my strength. What what does the Bible say? It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. The leaders of the church are creating a sacred space to hear the Lord. Have you created a space to hear from God? Many of you guys think that you know where you're going in life. Have you even given any space for God to ruin your plans? You're like, no, (laughs) that's why I don't do it. God is asking you today, you will exhaust your life, you'll exhaust yourself trying to find unconditional love in places that cannot be found. um, Secondly, in this uh, set apart part, is set apart people. Paul and Barnabas are separated as chosen instruments. Uh, My father-in-law, Paul, this is what we'll talk about Paul. Last week, you might know that Paul fell, uh, uh, passed out, hit the back of his head because of his heart condition. And so um, Paul was uh, not doing really well last Sunday. Um, it was a hard day all around. We learned about Kobe and his, his daughter. I mean, he's just, a, just in a world of death. I was thinking about this, this, this idea. I was, I, I was okay, I, I wrote a poem. And it was like this. It was, it was basically death 
enemy formidable cares not about celebrity or child's full potential. I mean, death is the enemy, right? Like, death is the real enemy. Like, we can look at each other all day long and point the fingers and say, it's all about you, it's all about you. But at the end of the day, when we see people that are sick, when we see people that are hurting, when we see that people have died, we say, death, you are the enemy because you do not care about the celebrity of man and you do not care about a beautiful young girl who died way before her time. Death does not care. This is why I say bring people to Alpha. Have people come near because people are longing to experience Jesus. And I'm just going to go full on Holy Spirit audible right now. I, um, this week, have been talking about Alpha a lot. And um, I've been talking to random people about Alpha a lot. And I think the 24-hour fitness that's nearby our, um, our apartment complex owes me money because at our gym, I don't think people go to our gym anymore because there's a crazy guy with a mustache that keeps inviting them to this thing called Alpha. I mean, I'm praying for random people at the gym. I'm like doing my pull-ups and stuff and be like, can I pray for you? Like, it's awkward. 24-hour fitness owes me money because they're, like, signing me up. Like, I'm not going to that, like, regular gym in the community. Like, too weird. So it's been actually really amazing. People have been not only getting prayer but asking to get prayers for healing. And I'm just like, God, why haven't I been doing this even more? On Friday, um, I saw someone and I felt like God wanted me to ask this person. And I was kind of like, my ratio is like super high with guys, really low with girls. Like I have not really asked any girls to Alpha. And I'm like, come on, Josh, got to get this ratio up over here. Um, But you know, like I'm, you know, I'm big and loud and I'm not big, I'm short and loud. (laughs) Why did that get a laugh? Um, and, And you know, like I just, I, I don't want to be threatening or weird or whatever, so I'm really careful. And so I saw this girl. She's working out. I'm like, I don't want to do this, God. And and so I walk by her, and God goes, who else will? Who else will? I'm like, oh, you're right. And so I go back, and she, and the cool thing is that she just takes out her um, earphones, like right when I walk up. And I was like, oh, God, you did this again. And I go... Excuse me, and this is all I've been saying to people. Um, How can I ask God to bless you today? Um, I'm a Christian. I pray. I know this sounds super weird. I'm sorry. But but can I ask God to bless you for anything? And she has a South African accent. And she goes, "Um, actually, my health. I would do the accent. I don't know it. Um, My health. And I go, uh, anything in particular? And she goes, I just found out a week ago that I have a tumor on my liver. And I'm like, oh, man, Lord, I was not ready for this. And I said, oh, my gosh, that is a lot. Um, would you mind if I, I pray for you? And she's like, yeah, can we go outside? I'm like, sure, we'll go, out, we'll go outside of the gym. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I know this is so weird, but I know that you need I, I know that you need healing, and so would you just put your hands out to receive, and I'm just going to pray for you. So I pray for the Holy Spirit to come and to heal her, and she starts crying. And tears are falling down her face. She's not a Christian. She's not a believer. She's from South Africa. She's like, I did not mean to come to Orange County to have a loud American just, like, run all over it. And I'm just like, like the fire in me is so strong and I'm like God how many of your people me included have this beautiful treasure that is in an earthen vessel that we can love and serve other people and we just walk by you know how easy it is I'll tell you another uh, uh, another uh, little story that God's working and doing um I was with Tom, Uncle Tom in the back. We were at this food place, and um, I was like, watch this, Tom. And I go, I go, hey, is there anything that I can ask God for you about? You know, is there anything? Uh, and to our waiter, and the waiter goes, 
oh yeah, my health. And I go, no way. And we start talking and he's like, oh, I love Moongo. And he likes Moongo. And I was like, hey, do you want to go to Alpha? And he's like, yeah, I want to go to Alpha. And then, and then he ended up, um, uh, I ended up giving him like a card for it and all of these things. And I'm like, that's awesome. Then I was with Garrett. Garrett, where are you? There you are, Garrett. Then I was at Garrett. Garrett's birthday. We're at Zove's. Um, and we're sitting there and our waitress comes up and I just ask her, is there anything I can ask God to bless you with? Poor Garrett. And if you know Garrett, Garrett's like, Garrett's like the sweetest guy ever. And he's like, Josh, what are you doing right now? Uh, and she actually tells me that her, uh, her and her boyfriend aren't doing well. And then I was like, I feel like God has given me just like kind of an image for you of kind of like a lighthouse and that you need to come to Safe Harbor. And then what ends up happening is she starts crying. <laughs> And, um, and I was actually after we already talked about Alpha, and me and Garrett end up start leaving, and she came after us, and she was like, hey, can you go give me a card about Alpha? And I was like, absolutely. Okay, why do I tell you these stories? I tell you these stories because I'm not special. This is not personality. I get frustrated just like you guys. I get, I get weirded out just like you guys. But the Holy Spirit is moving and looking for worshipers. Moving and looking for people that he might be filled with. And he set apart Paul and Barnabas. Look at Acts 9.15. But the Lord said to him, go. This was, was to Ananias because he was a chosen one to go and get Paul or Saul, the person that was persecuting. He says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of my name before the Gentiles and the kings of the children of Israel. I love that idea of instrument. Okay, getting back to Paul. Okay, sorry. Road trip back to Paul. My father-in-law who got hurt. Uh, my father-in-law is doing fine. He just got a pacemaker put into the old ticker. And I loved what his doctor said. He said, I've put 3,500 uh, 3, of these in and I haven't lost one. And he, he was like, I like the odds. And I, and, I, and I like that idea, right? Because it has nothing to do with his instruments. It has all to do with the doctor, right? And so what I love about this text is God says, Paul or Saul is a chosen instrument of mine. It's not about the scalpel and it's not about the tools. It's all about whose hands are the instrument or the equipment in. He sets apart the instrument to be used for God's purpose. For God's purpose. So where are we going? We create such safe and secure lives. We strive for comfort. We curate lives free from worry and pain. No wonder why so many people don't want to die. You want to know why people don't want to die? We're not afraid of death. We're afraid of going somewhere without our permission. We're not afraid of death. We don't want someone to tell us that we have to be done. Or we have to leave. We will leave the nest, so to speak proverbially, on our own terms. Could you imagine Paul? Um, if he lived into what John Ortberg calls his shadow mission... Um, a shadow mission is the pursuit of an unworthy purpose for your life. You might have a shadow vision. You might be living in a shadow vision or a, a shadow mission for your life. One that is not worthy of your life, and it's the shadow. It's you binging Netflix all day long. That is a shadow self. A shadow self is you just scrolling on the gram, clicking, liking, Deleting, gossiping, screenshotting, saying, did you see her? Like, that is the shadow mission of our lives. Could you imagine if that? See, our shadow mission leads us just five or ten degrees off our true path in direction of selfishness or comfort or arrogance. Of those few degrees over time become the difference between light in shadow. Could you imagine if Paul lived, to, uh, lived out being just okay with, one, with his one Jesus experience on the road to Damascus? I saw Jesus. I got kicked off, uh, you know, a donkey, and that was amazing, you know? Could you imagine if it was just that experience? If he was just fine listening to podcasts 
from Peter the fisherman because all of Paul's training was just useless, right? He like became this theologian and this, this scholar and this Pharisee, but he's like, you know what? God doesn't really care. He's using this fisherman. I'm just going to check out. <laughs> like I, I, I worked really hard creating a music career and doing all these things, but a person gets on, you know, the Disney channel and now they're famous for music. That's awesome. Key drop. Um, living off, he could have been a person living off the fumes of his salvation story. Maybe writing a bestseller, how he went from Hebrew to brewing Hebrews of being a coffee barista, and that's what he does now. Just living out his shadow, which is nothing wrong with being a barista. My beautiful wife was a barista, and that is the reason why I married her, because she was at Milk and Honey. My name's Josh. I went to the land of promise, which was the land flowing in milk and honey. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. (laughs) Could you imagine Paul just blogging about his experience from home? Could you imagine him tweeting about Barnabas of what he should be doing, making fun of Peter's Greek, being like, Greek, you suck at Greek. Like his Greek in in Mark's gospel is like really big uh, writing block letters. Like, could you imagine if Paul just like wanted to become a troll? You know what I mean? Just like online, just like just created memes for his life. Like that's what he did. Aren't you just so glad that he followed after the true mission that God called him to do. Then we see my favorite guy in the Bible, Barnabas. Acts 4, 32 through 37. Look at verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were one heart and soul, and no one said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And any of these things that belonged to him was his own. Um, And with great... uh Uh-oh. Rut row. Oh, there you go. Um, And with great power... There it is. Um... And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, listen, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, This is the guy, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, Barnabas was a man that was set apart. Okay, God created Paul to be the super nerd genius to write a third of the Bible, to go out into the world and preach the gospel, and God uses him as an instrument. But then God takes Barnabas and says, all I have is a field, but it's all Jesus's. And he never gets any of the credit because right after this, the chapter next is Ananias Sapphira who hid and said that they gave everything, but they didn't really give everything. And then they fell down dead. And then basically everybody was like, I'm not going to give anymore to the church. I don't want to die from a bad heart. And we totally miss out on what Barnabas does. This is the type of person that goes on the missionary journey with Paul. If you can get the Leslie Newbegin quote up, this is the thing that, Man, I don't have enough time today, so it's, I'm going to cut short. But I really want us to get this, so stay with me. Focus in. This is what Leslie Newbegin says. He says, The deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. The deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus. Can I tell you when I have been praying with all these people, random non-Christian people, my heart starts beating. And for a moment, I start feeling like I'm getting onto the pace and rhythm of God's heartbeat. His heartbeat is for the lost. His heartbeat is for the unlovely. His heartbeat is for those that are far off. You feel like, man, I feel like Jesus is so far off. Go near sinners. Go love the unlovely. Go serve the poor and the broken. The heartbeat of God is right there. Secondly, sent out. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands and sent them off. 
So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, um, or Salamis, whatever you want to say, um, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews, and they had John Mark to assist them. So the first thing that we see is that the church lays hands on them and sends them out. They gain authority and know that, they, that though they might feel alone, at this moment when the church puts its hands on the people, you can know you're not alone. Um, I got to meet this sweet um, uh, uh, Catholic nun when I was in England. And I asked her if she would pray for me. And she prayed one of the, and she's older, she was probably, she was probably like in her uh, mid to late 80s, and she held my hands, and they're very uh, little wrinkly, and I was holding her little hands, and she was looking at me, and I was like, oh my word, I am in the midst of a giant of the faith. Like, she is this tall, and, and I'm just like, spiritually, I'm just like, whoa. And she said to me, she goes, Lord, I pray for Josh, Joshua, she called me, and she goes, I pray that when he feels most alone, that he knows Sister Anne is praying for him. (laughs) Do you know how beautiful it is? We have the opportunity to put hands on people and say, let me pray for you because when you go and feel lonely, you can still remember my hands are upon you. They're sent off. A church is the one that sends people as love letters to the world. I hate losing people when they say, oh, God's calling me over here. God's calling me over. I hate losing you guys. I want to grab you guys. I want to keep you guys forever. I don't ever want you guys to grow up and get out of here. But I know that if the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth, I have to hold everything with open hands and lightly and say, go, we'll party in heaven. Go, we'll party in the new creation. I have to. But I love this. Ultimately, we see that he is sent out for a specific audience. If we're set apart as a specific instrument, then we're also sent out for a specific audience, those who are not Jews and those who are at the ends of the world. Ultimately, what I love is it it says this in verse uh, 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, it is always the Spirit that is doing Descending. J.R.L. Tolkien in his book, Fellowship of the Rings, says, It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step on the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. Oh, if you want to venture, if you want to have life with the Spirit, you better watch out. Because if you want God to really use you, he'll only send you to Africa if that's where you want to go. So don't worry about that. But God is doing something now. Um, I just do not have time. So I'm just going to read this last thing and then I'm going to pray, okay? I'm sorry. Um, in, Brennan, in Brennan Manning's uh, Ragamuffin Gospel, um, uh, there is a book from uh, this great guy, Brennan Manning, uh, called The Lion, the Lamb, The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus. And he says, There are two visions of life, two kinds of people. The first see life as a possession to be carefully guarded. They are called the settlers. The second see a life as a wild, fantastic, explosive gift. They are called pioneers. These two types give rise to two kinds of theology, settler theology and pioneer theology. According to Wes Sellinger in his book, Western Theology, the first kind, settler theology, is an attempt to answer all the questions, define and, ho- uh, define and housebreak some sort of supreme being into a house cat, establish the status quo on golden tablets in a cinema scope. Pioneer theology is an attempt to talk about what it means to receive the strange gift of life. The Wild West is the setting for both theologies. Okay, you ready for this? This is how I'm going to end. So really keep it honed in. In the center of the theology, the church is the courthouse. It is the center of town life. The old stone structures dominate the town squares. It's the windows. Uh, its windows are small, and this makes things dark inside. Within the courthouse walls, records are kept, taxes are collected, trials are held for bad guys. The courthouse is the settler symbol of the law and order and stability, and most importantly, security. The mayor's office is on the top floor. His eagle eye ferrets out on the smallest details of town life. 
Now, in settler theology, the church is the covered wagon. It's the house on wheels, always on the move. The covered wagon is where the pioneer eats, sleeps, fights, loves, and dies. It bears the marks of life and movement. It creaks. It is scarred with arrows, bandaged with uh, bailing wire. The covered wagon is always where the action is. It moves towards the future and doesn't bother to glorify its own ruts. The old wagon is com- isn't comfortable, but the pioneers don't mind. They are more into the adventure than comfort. In settler theology, God is the mayor. He is a sight to behold. Dressed like a dude from back east, he lounges in an overstuffed chair in his courthouse. He keeps the blinds drawn. No one sees him or knows him directly. But since there is order in town, who can deny he is there? The mayor is predictable and always on schedule. The settlers fear the mayor, but look to him to clear the payroll and keep things going. Peace and quiet are the mayor's main concerns. That's why he sends the sheriff to check on the pioneers who ride into town. Now, in pioneer theology, God is the trail boss. He is rough and rugged, full of life. He chews tobacco, drinks straight whiskey. The trail boss lives, eats, sleeps, fights with his people. Their their cell being is his concern. Without him, the wagon wouldn't move. Living as as a free man would be impossible. The trail boss often gets down in the mud with the pioneers to help the wagon push, which often gets stuck. He prods the pioneers when they get soft and want to turn back. He fit uh, uh, his fists is an explosion of his concern. In settler theology, Jesus is the sheriff. He's the guy who is sent by the mayor to enforce the rules. He wears a white hat. He drinks milk, outdraws the bad guys. The sheriffs decide who is thrown into jail. There is a saying in the town that goes, those who believe the mayor sent the sheriff and follow the rules, they won't stay in Boot Hill when it comes to be their time. In pioneer theology, Jesus is the scout. He rides out ahead to find out which the way the pioneer should go. He lives all the dangers of the trail. The scout suffers every hardship, is attacked by Indians, Native Americans. Through his words and actions, he reveals the true intentions of the trail boss. By looking at the scout, those on the trail learn what it means to be a pioneer. In settler theology, the Holy Spirit is a saloon girl. Her job is to comfort the settlers. They come to her when they feel lonely or when it gets dull or dangerous. Um, She scratches them under the chin and makes them everything okay. The saloon girl squeals to the sheriff when someone starts disturbing the peace. In pioneer theology, the Holy Spirit is the buffalo hunter. He rides along with the covered wagon and the furnishes fresh meat for the pioneers. Without it, they would die. The buffalo hunter is a strange character, sort of a wild man. The pioneers can never tell what he will do next. He scares the hell out of the settlers. He has a big black gun that goes off like a cannon. He rides into town on Sunday to shake up the settlers. You see, every Sunday morning, the settlers have a little ice cream party in the courthouse. Isn't that nice? With his gun in hand, the buffalo hunter sneaks up to one of the courthouse house windows, he fires out tremendous blasts and rattles the whole courthouse. Men jump out of their skin, women scream, dogs bark, chuckling to himself, the buffalo hunter rides back to the wagon uh, wagon train, shooting up the town as he goes. In settler theology, the Christian is a settler. He fears the open, unknown frontier. His concerns is to stay on the good terms with the mayor and keep out the sheriff's way. Safety first is his motto. To him, the courthouse is a symbol of security, peace, order, and happiness. He keeps his money in the bank. The banker is his best friend. The settler never misses an ice cream party. In pioneer theology... The Christian is the pioneer. He's a man or woman of daring, hungry for a new life. He rides hard, knows how to use a gun when necessary. The pioneer feels sorry for the settlers and tries to tell them of the joy and fulfillment of the life on the trail. He dies with his boots on. In settler theology, the clergyman, for some of you, um, Generation Z, uh, pastor, is the banker. Within his vault are locked the values of the town. He is a highly respected man. He has a gun, but he keeps it hidden in his desk. He feels that he and the sheriff have a lot in common, right? Same hair as Jesus. After all, they both protect the bank. In pioneer theology, the clergyman, the pastor, is the cook. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't furnish the meat. He just dishes up what the buffalo hunter provides. This is how he supports the movement of the wagon. He never confuses his job with what Uh, um, uh, that of the trail boss, the scout, or the buffalo hunter. He sees himself as just another pioneer who has learned to cook. The cook's job is to help the pioneers pioneer. 
In settlers' theology, faith is trusting in the safety of the town, obeying the laws, keeping your nose clean, believing the mayor is in the courthouse. In pioneer theology, faith is a spirit of adventure, the readiness to move out, to risk everything on the trail. Faith is obedience to the restless voice of the trail boss. In settler theology, sin is breaking one of the town's ordinances. In pioneer theology, sin is turning and wanting to go back. In settler theology, salvation is living close to home, hanging around the courthouse. In pioneer theology, salvation is being more afraid of a sterile town um, life than death on the trail. Salvation is joy at the thought of another day to push on into the unknown. It is trusting the trail boss, following the scout, while living on the meat furnished by the buffalo hunter. So I say to you, what if the God of all says, what do you want? And you say, I come and I seek security, I seek comfort, and I seek unconditional love. And this is you as a Christian. God says, you have all these things. You have eternal security in my son. You don't have just comfort, you have the comforter. And you don't just have unconditional love, you have a heavenly father. The deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is, on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. Let's pray.